following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, love at first sight. He was just super cute. She was definitely the one. But he had a wandering eye. Things really start spiraling downward. At that moment, my world shattered. Four affairs, followed by two suicide attempts. I had given up all hope. Why did she give him one last chance? God stepped in and saved my life. On today's 700 Club. Well, well, America, get ready for some very big changes. From climate change to foreign policy to immigration and more, Joe Biden is set to begin reversing course from the past four years. If he takes office, the former vice president is reportedly planning to sign a series of executive orders overturning President Trump's policies. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has the details. America's back. If elected, the 46th president plans to reverse several of President Trump's policies by executive orders. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. But Biden wants to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Climate change and climate warming, the global warming, is an existential threat to humanity. The former VP wants net zero emissions by 2050 and proposed $2 trillion in clean energy and infrastructure spending. We will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization. Again, Biden plans to reverse that move. He also wants to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal as long as the regime comes back into compliance. Iran has a robust, impressive ballistic missile system that can, uh, that can deliver a nuclear warhead and now now they have, they're very precise, and now they have what they call a missile train where they can fire a multiple ballistic missiles at one time. And even Israel, with probably the, with the world's best anti-missile system, may not be able to uh, hit all those incoming missiles. Iran claims it would reduce its stockpile of uranium if Biden lifts sanctions on Tehran, <laughs> which Iran's foreign minister suggests could be done through three executive orders. Biden also aims to use executive powers in these areas, repealing Trump's travel ban from Muslim countries like Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. Reinstating the Dreamers program, which allows kids of undocumented immigrants to remain in the U.S., and undoing Trump's 2017 order banning transgender individuals from the military. In a Biden administration, they would serve openly in the armed forces. Now, Biden's team is planning the EO route in case the Senate control stays in Republican hands, making legislation a challenge. We won't know that outcome until early January. Ben Kennedy, CBN News. Well, get ready for big changes. This is just sort of the, the beginning, if, if you will. Uh, one of the current concerns I have is the World Health Organization. The documentation is quite clear that they allowed China to cover up and they allowed China to, to make sure the world did not have the sources of the pandemic. Uh, and they've admitted that now in the early months of this, you go back to January, February, and March, and they were praising China at the same time, enabling China to cover it up. Uh, they admitted it, uh, but nobody seemed to, to pay attention to that. And for us to say, well, we're willingly going to get back into a, a organization that said, well, by the way, we lied to you about the, the biggest health crisis in the world. Um, that literally makes no sense. Why in the world will we ever support that? Um, we need to get the source of COVID, how it happened. We still don't have honesty out of China as to what really happened in Wuhan. Uh, and that, I think, is, is necessary. So that's just one area. Here's one that, that I hope, if there is a new administration, I hope they take very seriously. Go back to 1994 and the crime bill of 1994, which uh, if, if Biden is the president-elect, well, he voted for that back in 1994. Uh, that has led us to be one of the most incarcerated nations in the world. Uh, can we reverse that? And can uh, we recognize that that crime bill sparked 
uh, 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 horror within the African-American community where 35% of African-Americans aged 18 to 35 today have some kind of relationship with the criminal justice system. They're either in jail or on parole or under indictment, uh, and it's a disproportionate impact on the African-American community. My hope is that we can see, finally see some change to that and stop being a police state and stop incarcerating people at a rate that no other country in the world has. Well, in other news, President Trump is still contesting the election. So why is he giving the go ahead for the transition process? And what, what are we learning about Joe Biden's first batch of cabinet nominees? Well, John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Joe Biden is naming several members of the Obama administration for key posts. Meanwhile, even though President Trump is still fighting it out in the courts, he says the transition process should begin for the good of the country. CBN's Jenna Browder reports. After weeks of legal battles, the Trump administration has given the go ahead to the federal government to begin the transition process for Joe Biden's team. But the president is clear he is not conceding the election. The GSA ascertaining Monday Biden is the apparent winner of the election. This opening the door for the transition process and allowing his team to meet with federal agencies to prepare for Inauguration Day. It would make it a lot easier if the president were to participate. And now it appears he is. President Trump tweeting he recommended the GSA begin the process because, quote, it is in the best interest of our country, adding that he'll, quote, keep up the fight as he contests the election. This after the Trump team suffered another legal setback Monday, Michigan certifying its results, giving Biden a win. So are you expecting Republicans to put up any significant roadblocks to your nominations? Are you kidding me? Meanwhile, Biden is starting to announce his cabinet nominees, many of them former members of the Obama administration. He's expected to name former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen as the first woman to be Treasury Secretary, and is also nominating the first female Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. At Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas would become the first Latino director. Plus, Antony Blinken as Secretary of State and John Kerry in a top climate position. Three words, a safe establishment process. CBN chief political analyst David Brody says the Biden team is staying in the middle. And they're going to make sure uh, that that folks that Biden trust and are are not far left. Well, John Kerry is kind of far left, uh, but a lot of them are going to be more down that center left lane. And I think that's what you're going to see. And Inauguration Day is January 20th, now less than 60 days away. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Well, despite a rise in COVID-19 cases and warnings from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, many Americans are traveling this Thanksgiving weekend, although it's nowhere near the normal levels of holiday travel. The TSA reports it has screened more than 3 million people at the nation's airports in recent days. That's less than half the number of people who flew this time last year. Americans apparently heeding the plea of health officials to stay home for the sake of higher risk family members. We definitely do not want to see Thanksgiving family get togethers be Christmas family funerals. Meantime, AstraZeneca is the third drug maker to announce its COVID vaccine is showing promising results up to 90% effective. This as Pfizer filed its FDA application for emergency use authorization Friday for its vaccine. Moderna is expected to follow soon. The chief scientific advisor for Operation Warp Speed says he believes the first vaccinations could come by mid-December. With the level of efficacy we have, 95%, 70% or so of the population being immunized would allow for true herd immunity to take place. That is likely to happen somewhere in the month of May. That is promising news. For more on this story, let's go back to Gordon. Well, CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson is with us for more on the vaccines. And Lori, let's go a little deeper on distribution. How many doses are ready and how quickly can they be distributed? 
Gordon, between Pfizer and Moderna, and it is believed that both of those vaccines, they're very similar to the messenger RNA type of vaccine. We expect that the FDA is going to issue an emergency use authorization for both probably around December 10th. That's in about two weeks from Thanksgiving. And both vaccines are ready to go. They're ready to be distributed. So as soon as the FDA issues that emergency use authorizations, those vaccines can be distributed to all of the various states depending on their population. So obviously Connecticut wouldn't get as many as safe Texas, for example. And then the CDC is going to say exactly who gets the vaccine first. There are 40 million doses, but as you know, Gordon, that means 20 million people will get vaccinated because each person needs two shots. And it's expected that the CDC will say that frontline health care workers are going to be the very first people who get them. And then uh, after that, people who are older who also have pre-existing conditions, several complications, perhaps those who are living in nursing home and assisted living will get theirs after that. Well, frontline workers should get it. Let, let's dig into the, the messenger RNA vaccine uh, and try to dispel fears. Uh, my assumption is they don't have any uh, fetal tissue lines in them. Uh, so that's correct. If that I'm, is correct. Yeah. Uh, and the second is I keep hearing, it keeps coming back, that somehow the vaccine is going to have some chip implanted in your body. Uh, these chips are just to track the vial, not the person, and it just lets the CDC know when the vial has been used and where it's been used. Is that correct? Exactly. That is, and I'm so glad you're dispelling this because there are a lot of conspiracy rumors floating around uh, on the internet, on social media, and some other places too. And so you're right. It's sort of like a barcode, but the key is it's not in the serum. It is on the packaging because it's very important to keep track of where these vaccines were distributed. Because as I mentioned, you get one, and then three weeks later you get the other one, and your immunity isn't fully in force until a a month after that first one, so one week after that second one. So we're talking about these 20 million people who are supposedly going to be getting their vaccines in the mid-December aren't going to really have that robust immune response until the middle of January. Let's turn to treatment. Uh, Regeneron, uh, I believe that's what the president was, was able to take and bounce back so quickly from this. Has that now been approved? And if so, what are the uses for it and who can get the, the treatment? Well, you're right. This is the, the Regeneron antibody treatment was what President Trump received when he recovered so quickly. He received two other pharmaceutical drugs at the same time that have also been given emergency use authorization. And this Regeneron antibody treatment is the second antibody treatment to be given emergency use authorization. We saw this with the Eli Lilly one a few weeks ago. And so this antibody treatment is really designed for people who are in the early stages of the virus, who are at risk of being hospitalized. So in other words, this is designed to keep people out of the hospital because what it does is it, it's an infusion and it infuses antibodies into a person right away so that they don't have to wait for their own body to make the antibodies. And a lot of these people don't make enough antibodies and this is where they run into trouble. So we're uh, there are about 80,000 doses now in January should have about 300,000 doses. That's really not that many when you consider we have a population of 350 million people. All right. Well, Lori, thank you for your insights. My pleasure. In other news, two major typhoons struck the Philippines this month. The two massive storms swept through one week apart, leaving thousands homeless and without food and water. Although some victims live in remote areas, CBN's Operation Blessing made the rugged journey to bring them relief. Lucille Toulousan reports. Rosalinda Lucero told CBN News, our abaca crops and the coconuts are all gone. Where will we get food? Every time I see a helicopter, I wave and shout for help, but they don't see me. Rosalinda is among the thousands who lost their homes when Typhoon Goni hit their town in the Bicol region. She is worried because she has nothing left to feed her grandchildren. 
It's been a week since Goni struck, but they have not received any assistance because their village is hard to reach. With the military's help and coordination with the local government, an Operation Blessing team traveled to Rosalinda's village, crossing rivers to bring the remote village much-needed food, hygiene kits, and prayer. We want to let them know that they are not forgotten, they are not left behind. Operation Blessing uh, had the heart to come here to let them know that uh, we, we love them, Jesus loves them. Rosalinda says she is grateful because finally her cries for help have been heard. However, after only a few days of good weather, another strong typhoon hit the Beagle region and other parts of the country. Barely recovering from the devastation brought about by Typhoon Goni, the people here are bearing the brunt of another strong typhoon, Vamco. Thank God Operation Blessing has sent a team in advance prepared to give immediate assistance to the victims of this storm. Operation Blessing teams are also conducting disaster relief efforts in Metro Manila and other provinces that have also been directly hit by Typhoon Vamco. They will be distributing food, mats, blankets, hygiene kits, and drinking water to suffering typhoon survivors. Lucille Telusen, CBN News, Camarines Norte, Philippines. I lived in the Philippines for five years. I went through several typhoons. Uh, some areas are known as Typhoon Alley. I even went through a super typhoon. I haven't seen any devastation like what, what I've seen. Uh, the pictures, the video that's come back. Whole towns underwater, uh, people without food, without water. But here's the good news. Because of you, because of your faithful giving, Operation Blessing Philippines is able to be on the ground to provide much re needed relief. If you want to be part of the relief effort, if you want to uh, let your voice be heard to say, we care for you, we love you, we want to help you in the middle of this disaster, you can call us, 1-800-700-7000, say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can also write us, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Or you can text, if you can memorize these letters, OBDR, which stands for Operation Blessing Disaster Relief. Text the letters OBDR to 71777. So either way you do it, do it now. People are in need, and they need our help. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, the hidden costs of school shutdowns. Parents quitting their jobs to stay home with their kids. It's creating a problem that could last longer than the pandemic. What's being done to help these moms? And then later, this man planned to pull the trigger. His wife planned to pop the pills. What drove this couple to the brink of suicide? And how did twin miracles save them both? You'll see it all later on today's program. A forced to choose between careers and children. That's the dilemma for working moms in the midst of the pandemic. Nearly 900,000 women left the workforce in September, right at the start of the school year. What are the possible long-term effects of this trend? Well, Caitlin Burke has the story. Some of the earliest jobs lost during the COVID-19 pandemic were in restaurants, salons, hotels, retail, all industries dominated by women. Then, just as the economy began to reopen, schools remained closed, keeping children at home to learn virtually and forcing parents to make it work. I was then working from home and also being a, a teacher. So I'm homeschooling four different children, helping them, you know, managing different learning styles, helping them get what they need while trying to, you know, still progress in my professional career. That became unsustainable for Danie Thomas, who chose to quit her job as a director for a nonprofit and focus full time on her family. Thomas is among nearly 900,000 women who left the workforce in September, right as the school year began. Every mom, every person, period, has to make difficult decisions. But when a mother sees that, um, that things have to shift quickly, we kind of just step in and we make it happen. 
I knew that I wasn't going to be able to go full throttle in my career and then full throttle as a, now I'm, I'm a teacher again. One potential downside for Thomas is that according to a Washington Post analysis, mothers of school-aged children are taking longer to re-enter the workforce. Economists fear this could have long-term consequences for working women. The authors of a report published by Northwestern University state that not only will it take longer for these women to find work, they also will find it harder to get jobs comparable to their previous positions. Researchers conclude that could result in decades of women earning less. Meanwhile, this pandemic is also weighing heavy on mothers who are working outside the home. I'm a manager in my position. I help take care of sick children all day. I was like, and then I have to go home and I still have to teach mine and try to be, you know, a, a mother to my, my eight month old and then be a teacher to my first grader and my seventh grader and then try to be a wife to my husband. The stress and the anxiety have, were literally starting to give me chest pain. Don Martin returned to work for maternity leave in August. Then only a month later, she found out her two older children would be learning from home. Going back into the workforce and then finding out that our state still, you know, and then our county weren't going to open our schools back up and, you know, the, the risk and everything else were going up. And I was like, how, how am I supposed to help them? How are we supposed to teach them with their teachers if we have to be at work at the same time? Staying home isn't an option financially for her family. So Martin often finds herself helping with school assignments from work, at nights, and on weekends. Her limitations weigh heaviest when she sees her children struggling. It really hurts as a parent when you have to ground your child because you know if they were going to school, they'd be in class. They'd be participating. They wouldn't have the late assignments. They wouldn't have the tardiness. And... Our oldest went from an A, B, honor roll to F's and D's. Many economists say priority number one needs to be getting kids back in school. They're pushing Congress to pass another stimulus with checks specifically for parents with children, hoping to provide some financial cushion to help pay for daycare or private schooling. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, it's not just women suffering in this pandemic, it's also children suffering. Uh, look at the developmental loss, uh, the lack of socialization, all of these things that come uh, during your school years. And if you're deprived from that school environment, from the classroom environment, what does that mean? Uh, most parents aren't equipped to do the homeschooling, um, but they're being forced to get equipped uh, and they're, I, I certainly applaud them for getting it done and saying, I, I need to be there for my children. I can't let them slip back. I've, I've got to provide for them. So we as a community, we as a nation uh, in our, our cities, our neighborhoods, please, if you know anyone that has school-aged children, realize how they're, they're doing double time right now and how can we pull together as a nation to help them. Uh, if that stimulus package is okay, but I, I think the greatest stimulus can ha happen from caring neighbors saying, uh, we want to help you, we want to be a part, uh, how can we lend a hand? Uh, you're overwhelmed, and if you've got the ability, uh, please provide that because our nation needs you. Terry? Well, still ahead, he served eight tours in Afghanistan and came home with a crippling case of PTSD. Hear how one soldier won the biggest battle of his life. But first, a marriage's wake-up call. She picked up her husband's phone and his girlfriend was on the other line. To make matters worse, that wasn't his only affair. So how can this marriage be saved? Well, that's coming up. Despite all that's going on around us, we do have many blessings, don't we? So before you rush the stores on Black Friday, be a part of something life-changing for many, many people in need. CBN's Give Back Tuesday campaign runs from now through December the 1st. This is your opportunity to say thanks for the blessings that you enjoy. Join us by calling 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit CBN.com. There are so many people hoping and praying for someone to come and help them. 
you can give back and be the answer to those prayers. So give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Gordon? Alicia had given her husband a second chance and a third and a fourth, and still Brian kept having affairs. Finally, Alicia had enough. She filed for divorce, planned to end her life, and Brian had the exact same idea. Brian and Alicia have been married for more than 20 years. They met as teenagers and fell in love fast after their paths crossed at a grocery store. He jokingly says I was stalking him. <laughs> but um, he was in the grocery, you know, stalking, and me and my, my mother and my sisters, we saw him, and we thought he was just super cute. I knew the first time I seen her that she was definitely the one. We dated about six months, and then nine months after that, we were married on April 12th, um, 1997. They spent the first couple years getting to know each other better, but eventually their time together lessened and tension was building between them. We were, uh, I had just started nursing school, so I was gone all day. And, you know, Brian worked um, second shifts. And then when we would connect on the weekends, it was arguing about, um, I think it was a lack of intimacy, the lack of time together. We just, we both wanted what we wanted and we wasn't willing to give and I think that's where things really start spiraling downward. Meanwhile, their family was growing, but their arguments escalated and would often lead to Brian leaving home for weeks, even months at a time. Brian became a successful contractor and prided himself in being a provider, but he filled a void he felt with familiar vices. He found the attention he was looking for in other women. Deep down, I knew what was going on, but um, I was still trying to be a somewhat good husband, if that makes sense, and provide and, and keep things at home intact. Um, I was hiding the alcohol in my truck, um, hiding my phone in my truck in the evenings in case somebody would call or reach out to me so she would know and hiding. I'd go home at night, take showers, get out of the shower, but still felt dirty. I knew right and wrong I just couldn't get free from the things of the world, no matter how hard I tried. Several years had passed, and Alicia had given birth to their second child when Brian's secrets came to light. I remember waking up one morning at 6 a.m. to the phone ringing. At that moment, my world shattered. Never in my mind would have ever thought that, that my husband would be cheating on me. Alicia forgave him and agreed to work on their relationship. But later, when the infidelities continued, Alicia finally reached her breaking point and filed for divorce. Feeling rejected and hopeless, she attempted suicide. After the fourth affair, I had given up all hope. Um, I had filed for divorce. I had been on an antidepressant for about three years and I decided that I was going to overdose on those pills. And so when Brian came to get the kids one day, I'd asked him if he would pick up my prescription. It was a full three months. And so when he brought them back, took the children and left, I was going to take them all. And um, when I opened the bottle, there was only three pills inside. And so when I contacted Brian to find out where the rest of them was, there should have been hundreds, he said that the pharmacy had, they couldn't account for them, they were just gone. At my lowest moment was when God stepped in and saved my life. When I asked God, you know, what to do about Brian, and so lovingly, he just asked me, would you give him one more chance? As Alicia began to let God heal her heart, Brian was facing the man he had become. I had tried to commit suicide myself down at my grandfather's farm. I had, you know, taken a gun and put it underneath my chin and pulled the trigger. And, you know, of course it didn't go off. I remember God telling me, this is your last chance. and knew that I had to change as a dad and a husband. And that was a big turning, turning point for me. Broken and desperate, he surrendered his heart to God. Brian moved back into their home. Together, they participated in couples counseling 
and committed to keeping God first in their marriage while they rebuilt their communication and trust. Got rid of my worldly friends. I'd made a promise to myself that I would never get in a truck and leave like I had so many times in the past. I would go outside and sit and just pray. It brought me to a really strong relationship with him, which in turn turned into a strong relationship with Alicia and the kids. When we incorporated God back in, when we invited Him back in, when we repented for removing Him, He just started to rebuild our marriage and our love for one another. Brian and Alicia say their love for each other is stronger than ever, and it's all because they learned to love each other as Christ loves them. Where it is today, uh, it's almost like trying to imagine heaven. You know, as much as we can imagine, as good as it'd be, well, We'll still be blown away on the day we get there. And uh, I feel the same way with our marriage. Today, what it is, um, we're best friends. We love spending time with each other. And uh, I can imagine waking up a day without her by my side or ending a day without her by my side. You know, Brian, we're best friends. I can't imagine waking up without her, without her in my life. That's what God wants. He wants happy marriages. He wants loving marriages. He wants righteous children. He wants all of these things. He wants you to have the generational blessing of intact marriages so that uh, links are forged that literally last generationally that your children, your grandchildren, even your great-grandchildren recognize what a wonderful thing marriage is. It builds strong families. It builds generations. Now, in today's culture, it's not particularly popular to talk about sexual sin, but the Bible does. It does quite frequently. And unless you think somehow, you know, we're now in this realm of grace, rethink that because it's repeated over and over and over again in the New Testament that sexual sin is actually warfare against your own soul. I'll give you one verse and it's specifically addressed to adultery. And it's from John chapter, not John, James, the book of James, chapter 4, verse 4, that he says to adulterers and adulteresses, both sexes are involved. He says to both of them, friendship with the world is enmity with God. When you entertain these thoughts, when you entertain the behavior, when you excuse it, when you say, you know, God's going to be okay with this. Please think again. He's not okay with it. He doesn't want this for you. And realize that you engaging in the behavior puts you at odds with God and with his plan and with his purpose for your life. For Brian, he, he fell in love with the attention. And, and that's what this is. He's not falling in love with a person. He's falling in love with the attention. And, and it's feeding something in him. And James is talking about adulterers who are actually adulterers against God. Uh, you're, you're at enmity with God. You're, you're saying, I need something else besides God to fill that void in me. But here's the great news. And you see it in Brian's story, you see it in Alicia's story. Both of them came to the end. They both wanted to end their lives. Their marriage was in tatters. Brian couldn't get free. He kept repeating the behavior over and over and over again. Couldn't get free. But they finally found, no, this isn't the way. When you turn from your behavior, you turn from it and say, I don't want this anymore. I want God. I want him in my life. I want everything that he has for me. I'm all in with him. I turn away from these things and I turn to the living God. Here's the great news. It's the best news the world has ever heard. People have ever heard. Best news ever. God 
will forgive you. He'll cleanse you. Don't think he'll excuse it. And don't think while you're in enmity with him, he's okay with it. He's not. He wants you to turn from it. And you saw with Brian and Alicia the good things that can happen, how it can restore a marriage where you can become best friends, where you can't imagine a day without them. He can give you love. He can give you joy. He can give you peace. But you have to turn. And you have to say, not my will, not my way. God, I'm all in with you. I want your way. If this is for you, do the same thing they did. They turned it over to God. They turned first themselves and their own hearts over to God. And then he stepped in. He's able to heal. He's able to restore. He's able to give you, it's a gift, righteousness, peace, and joy. If you want it, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let God do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I confess to you right now that my heart has strayed from you. And against you, I have sinned. So, Lord God Almighty, I turn. I turn from everything I've done wrong, every thought that I've had that's been against you. And I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that you restore to me the joy of my salvation. I ask that you come into my heart and that you change my heart and change what I put my affections towards. I want to love you undividedly with my whole heart, my whole being, everything. Without you, I can't do this, but Lord, with you, I can do all things. So come in, make me new again, for I ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. So give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We're not here to judge you. We're here to tell you God loves you. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore your marriage. And if you want Bible verses, you want a Bible teaching about uh, what's God's plan for marriage, how can you restore a marriage, uh, we've got a free packet for you. It's called Love and Marriage. Uh, and all you have to do is call us. We'll send it to you as a PDF. We can also mail it to you if you don't have a computer. Uh, all it's, it's completely free. All you have to do is call us and we'll send it to you. 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Well, still ahead, he's a former Marine and an MMA world champion. So why did his wife tell him he's not a fighter? Plus, these seniors are staying home to be safe. So who's delivering much needed supplies right to their front door? Find out after this. And welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Evangelist Franklin Graham once again is calling on Americans to pray over the election. On Facebook, he posted, as we wait for the election results to be finalized, we need to pray. If there was fraud, let's pray that God would reveal it and that those responsible would be found out. On the other hand, he wrote, if there was no fraud, pray that God would make that known as well. The American people need to know the truth. Graham also asked readers to share and post, uh, share the post rather, and ask others to pray as well. Well, Christmas is coming to the White House. In a tradition dating back to 1966, First Lady Melania Trump welcomed the arrival of the official White House Christmas tree Monday. First Lady tweeting the 18 and a half foot Fraser fir comes from Dan and Brian Trees, a Christmas tree farm in West Virginia. The tree will be the centerpiece of the White House Blue Room. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this.
A niece and her husband are high-risk seniors, and they don't want to endanger themselves by going to a food bank. So Operation Blessing is bringing the food bank to them. During times of crisis, the most vulnerable need extra help. Operation Blessing partner Grace and Truth Community Church does a drive through food distribution, but they know there are older people in the community who won't be driving through the parking lot. Some of them don't have vehicles, and then some of them, they cannot drive, so they couldn't get here on their own to get the food. Some people like Lanise have dire family health concerns and are forced to stay home due to the impending threat of the coronavirus. My husband, he's 92. He's on hospice. He have a bad heart and he can't walk and I have to do everything for him. I have no family here. I don't want him to get anything and I don't want to get anything to give to him. Others like Jerry stay home because they know it's the best way to stay safe. I was a nurse for 43 years and I did public health. I'm 76 and so I'm in that group that they, they caution us to be careful. To reach people like Lanice, Jerry and many others, the church team jumps into their van and heads into the community for some door-to-door -door ministry. But they couldn't get here on their own to get the food, and so we take it to them. We want to be able to reach those that can't get to us, and that's what Jesus did. Each week, Grace and Truth receives a trailer load of food from Operation Blessing. Every year, Operation Blessing distributes millions of pounds of food to thousands of ministries nationwide. The families who receive it are incredibly grateful especially now. It's just a blessing. Thank you for your giving. Operation Blessing has been a blessing to the community and for our church, being able to have the resources to be a blessing to the community in the name of Jesus Christ is phenomenal. Getting food out to feed these vulnerable families is only possible because of the generous support of Operation Blessing Partners. We are so glad for what God has placed on your heart. The benefits of this, they're spreading out further than you could ever imagine. And so you are making an impact. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A lot of people, this is some of the only food that they get. It's a blessing. I'm so thankful. A thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club because you're part of that outreach. A portion of every gift you give to the 700 Club goes to the work of Operation Blessing. And, and we're, this, the number of, of people being helped, the number of, of centers, over 4,000 distribution centers, over 37 million pounds of food being distributed, all because people like you care enough to give. If that's you, if you want to be a part of what we're doing, you want to say, yes, I want to help people in need right here in America, uh, join the 700 Club. How much is it? Well, it's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at a higher level. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month, 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, I want you to have this. It's a teaching on the name of God, how the name of God can be a strong tower for you. Uh, and what do you do? How do you, how do you invoke the name? How do you believe the name when trouble comes, when life come at, comes at you hard? We'll have a variety of stories in this wonderful DVD showing people who have prayed the name of God for their situation and God came through for them. He'll come in through for you. I want you to have this. It's yours when you join. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, coming up, like an atomic bomb exploded in my soul. That's how this hero describes his battle with PTSD. At one point, he sat alone in his room with a loaded Glock by his side. What happened next? He'll share the rest of the story right after this. Robichaux snapped at his young daughter on her birthday. Why? She said she wasn't a fan of the icing on the cake, so Chad took the cake and threw it against the wall. That's when this Marine knew he had a problem, but he refused to do anything about it. Chad Robichaux was a member of an elite 
Military Joint Special Operations Task Force, who served eight tours in Afghanistan before being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD became the enemy that Chad could not overcome. His crippling panic attacks and fits of rage, fueled by shame over his perceived military failures and a crumbling marriage, almost led to suicide. Fortunately, Chad did not become a statistic of veteran suicide. In his new book, An Unfair Advantage, Chad describes how he climbed out of his personal abyss and later founded the Mighty Oaks Foundation, a faith-based initiative with programs to heal combat trauma and restore veterans to wholeness. Joining us now for more of the story is Chad Robichaud. Chad, welcome back to the program. You Thank always you wanted to be a Marine. You were deployed to Afghanistan eight times. After returning home, you were diagnosed with PTSD. What was going on with you at the time? I think when I initially came home, uh, you know, I had been dealing with some of the symptoms of PTSD for quite some time and just not really getting it under control or addressing it. Early on, uh, probably midway through my deployments, um, you know, life would be just wrangled, angry, frustrated, manifested in some physiological symptoms uh, that I know now to be early signs of PTSD, you know, numbness in my arms and face, feeling like my throat was swelling shut and I couldn't breathe, real heaviness in my chest, like feeling like I was, same symptoms you would feel of a heart attack. And just coming to the conclusion that, yeah, these are anxiety symptoms, but if I say something to the guys I work with or people around me, my peers, they would think I was weak, uh, potentially like peer level push me out. Or if I went to mental health, I would my, my clearance, my, my top secret clearance and my access to the jobs that I was doing would be revoked. And uh, so I just figured it was something I could handle. I could push it down. It would pass. And I tried to continue uh, pressing forward. Only those symptoms got much worse and uh, came crashing down after my and, and eventually I had to come home and sit before a clinical psychologist and be diagnosed with PTSD, which uh, the panic attacks at that point around the time of diagnosis was debilitating. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people explain panic attacks and I'm not dismissing anybody's experience, but some people will say things like, I was in traffic the other day and I had panic attacks. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Like when I say I had panic attacks and it was like, the only way I know to describe it is like if you were chained to the bottom of a swimming, swimming pool and drowning, like how desperate would you be for just a breath of air? Yeah. And, uh, but you're in that level of panic all the time. You never drown, you never die. And uh, that's the state I was in. Your day of reckoning came after your wife left you. Tell us what happened. Well, we spent uh, you know, we spent three years trying to pull it back together after Afghanistan, and you know the failures of my own decisions of not choosing to get well, of uh, of not really addressing the family issues, dealing with the panic attacks, dealing with the anxiety and depression, really hiding in professional successes that I was just chasing to make myself feel better and not addressing the real problems. It led us to, uh, it led me into relationships with other women, uh, walking out of my family. Uh, my wife decided to file for divorce and, uh, I agreed. We sold our home, moved to two separate apartments. And, you know, I found myself uh, alone in my apartment uh, in one moment and really challenging myself to say all these bad things that are happening to me, uh, and all the people I blame for them, I'm the common denominator. I'm the problem. And when I, came to the realization in my mind, the solution was maybe my family would be sad without me, but they would be better off. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment that I made a decision to take my life. And that same hopeless thought finds a home in the hearts of over 20 veterans every single day. Maybe my family, maybe my friends, maybe the world would be sad without me, but it would be better off. And, and for me, it was a very clear decision to take my life. I wasn't going to ask for help or cry out and, and let throw a signal to let people know because I didn't want anyone to intervene. So what was the and turning I, point for you? Well, it was, it was being at a rock bottom, being at a point to where I wanted to take my life. And I would sit in my closet. Uh, I, I had, I put my family pictures on the floor around me and try to, and I had a Glock 22 pistol, which is a 40 caliber pistol. And I tried to build up the courage to put that pistol to my head and, and pull the trigger. And the you one know, thing that, uh, uh, go ahead. Chad, God has a, a way of taking the worst things that happen in our lives and doing something that matters with them. Once we release them, surrender them to him. You've now created Mighty Oaks Foundation. What is that? Uh, well, Mighty Oaks Foundation is a, is a faith-based peer-to-peer program to where help other veterans who are uh, in active duty service members who are struggling with some of the thing, same things that I struggle with. And also we do a lot of work to prevent 
uh, to prevent these things from happening ahead of time. We run resiliency programs at bases around the world. I've spoken to over 150,000 active duty troops on resiliency, spiritual resiliency, suicide awareness, and uh, and divorce care. So we've, you know, again, I've spoken to over 150,000 troops, given away over 100,000 books. We have ranches that we do recovery programs. We have five different ranches. We pay for them to come. We pay for their travel. Uh, for the veterans coming active duty uh, from the veteran community, spouses. And we've had over 4,000 graduates uh, from oh. those programs and just have helped so many warriors. And uh, CBN has been a big part of that, by the way. CBN has been a, a big financial contributor to making that happen for these warriors. Your so book very is, grateful for that. I want to say your book, I want to be sure we mention this, is called The Unfair yeah. Advantage. What is The Unfair Advantage? One unfair advantage that I found uh, through my own recovery was, was uh, not only a relationship with Christ, but the truth in the Bible that, that helps us um, to be able to navigate all of life's struggles and in an unfair advantage. I go through every chapter. I share stories from Afghanistan, from my, my time as a professional fighter, and, and trials and challenges of life, and t- many times that I fell on my face. Uh, but I, I share the, the biblical principles that helped me uh, move forward and align my life with the life I believe I was created to live. And that truth uh, and God's word gives us an unfair advantage to any any battle that we're going to face in life. It gives us unfair unfair advantage to finding victory in life uh, challenges. Amen. It's so well written, and it's, it's something that you'll enjoy reading no matter who you are. But if you know somebody who served and has struggled with coming back home and just kind of getting back into life again, it's called an unfair advantage. It's available nationwide. Chet, thank you so much. It's always great to talk with you. Bless thank you. you. Gordon? Did not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's your in your power to help them. God bless.